two, one, two. Good morning to every one of you. Welcome to uh, the beginning of our Advent season for 2023. Um, you know, way back in the 60s and 50s that I remember, I never even thought we would be around in 2020. <laughs> and here we are, 2023, and we're still all alive and kicking and healthy, somewhat more wrinkles and whatnot and aches and pains, but we are still here. <laughs> So praise God we're here, <laughs> and uh, God is still in control, and we are uh, here to praise God this morning. Talking about praising God, um, you had a wonderful concert at the uh, First Congregational Church in Almont that some of our illustrious members of Jim and Leah and Doris Versick sang in, the Lapeer Concert Choir. They... I did, and Jim too, here. <laughs> yes, we heard you loud and clear. <laughs> it, was, it was a very good concert with a, a flute playing, a flautist, a flutist, and other instruments and drums and singers, soloists. If you still feel like hearing them, you can this afternoon at 4 o'clock at Trinity Methodist Church in Lapeer. Four o'clock this afternoon. So if any of you want to go, it's over there, and uh, that's I'm sure where Jim will be <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> and so that was it was a very uh, inspiring concert and a very beautiful venue there. Um, the Congregational Church in in Almont is very pretty. Doris or uh, uh, Bernice saw a bunch of her things that her relatives had brought in <laughs> for the Christmas trees, and so we were very happy to see all that. Are there other announcements this morning? Okay. So remember that. <laughs> okay, so that's about the point set is. And so if you want to help pay for these, thank you, Rod, for picking these up. Uh, they're beautiful to have them here in the first uh, week of Advent. And hopefully they'll last through for the whole Advent season. So <laughs> and, and they're beautiful. And we have Thelma also with an announcement. Okay, so let's remember that, the Christmas banquet, or the banquet, the potluck on the 11th. <laughs> okay, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> okay, so let's, re let's remember that on the 17th of December. You have, you have an answer? Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you. Thank you to everybody that did a bang up job of getting this place all ready to go. It looks gorgeous. It's so warm and intimate in here this morning. Um, you know, makes cloudy days really something about nothing, just the way everything has come together for this. So thank you one and all for getting the place ready for um, Advent. Just a couple of brief announcements. Um, I'll have my office hours tomorrow from 9 to 1 o'clock. If you want to call me, stop by. The coffee will be on. Uh, let me know. It'd be great to see you. Um, 
a big hello to people on Facebook and YouTube that are watching uh, the service this morning. We are going to be, of course, having communion, so have your favorite morning beverage and piece of bread so you can virtually partake in communion with us. Big thanks to Rod for getting chimes out. Uh, you should have gotten your copy. If not, it's uh, in the back sitting behind uh, Thelma and Mary Lou. Um, in there, I want to call attention to two articles. Um, one is uh, Barb was uh, nice enough to bring in a nice picture uh, of uh, some of our food pantry volunteers posing around the new freezer that was given to us through a grant by the CARE Task Force. Uh, nice article in there. Also, on Sunday, December the 17th, the morning of Thelma's awesome, wonderful Advent potluck, uh, we are going to be taking a special offering collection for one of the United Church of Christ's uh, funds called Our Church's Wider Mission. We have taken up such collections in the past, and what that fund is used for is basically to support the staff and the resources that the UCC Michigan Conference Office in East Lansing provides to our church and all of the churches. And I know you don't see it sometimes, but uh, the help that they provide is immeasurable, just out outstanding and wonderful. 70% uh, of the funds from the, our church's wider mission fund goes toward the Michigan Conference Office. The remaining goes to the UCC head office in Cleveland, Ohio. So on the 17th, prayerfully consider making a uh, contribution. Again, the details are in your Chimes newsletter for you to, uh, to look at. Thank you. Yes. Yes, and it was, it was very good, an award-winning um, instrumentalist, just, just absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, thank you, Doris. Uh, remember, uh, we have a reverse advent candle here, we're, uh, uh, <laughs> reverse advent, whatever you call it, um, whatever, calendar where we are giving uh, uh, donations to the food pantry, so remember that also. And I also want to say thank you again for those that helped decorate uh, the Noel out front is still not up, if you hadn't noticed, but there are no hooks up there because we did have the steeple painted this year, <laughs> if you recall, <laughs> and the hooks are gone. So at some point uh, during this season, hopefully, <laughs> we'll get the Noel up there. I mean, we only have enough hooks up there to put an N-O up there right now, so I don't think I better do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leah agrees. We don't want to put a no up there. <laughs> it better be the whole thing. <laughs> it might. It might get in the paper. <laughs> this is the church that says no. <laughs> okay. During this Advent season, we are going to begin our services by um, having a reading from notable uh, theologians or poets and that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to have a poem by uh, the 
Presbyterian Poet Laureate Ann Weems in a book that she wrote, In Search of Our Kneeling Place. And so in it, she reminds us that in this hustle and bustle of this season, that we need to ponder the true gift of gifts. And so it's in search of our kneeling place. In each heart lies a Bethlehem, and in where we must ultimately answer whether there is room or not. When we are Bethlehem bound, we experience our own advent in his. When we are Bethlehem bound, we can no longer look the other way, conveniently not seeing the stars, nor hearing the angels' voices. We can no longer excuse ourselves by busily tending our sheep for our kingdoms. This Advent, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has made known to us. In the midst of spend shopping sprees, let's ponder in our hearts the gift of gifts. Through the tinsel, let's look for the gold of the Christmas star. In the excitement and confusion, in the merry chaos, let's listen to the brush of angels' wings. This Advent, let's go to Bethlehem and find our kneeling place. So at this time, we will have the lighting of our Advent candle, which we will do with the Wednesday night uh, Bible study group. As our group is uh, getting ready to do our first Advent candle lighting, uh, I think you all are very familiar with the history and the wonderful traditions behind this. We have, of course, the three uh, candles. Sometimes they are uh, purple in other denominations, but uh, our wonderful Christmas committee has set up what we have right now, and of course, the Christ candle. And I have a wonderful handout I'll have for you after the service that says a little bit more about this tradition, lets you read up on it, and perhaps if you have such a setup at home, um, it'll help you understand further the magic and the history and the holiness behind this. Maybe that'll help. 
Many years ago, I was a director of a church camp, and I did that for many years. And this one particular week, there was a severe storm. It was the most is severe, worst storm that I had ever experienced, no matter where I was. And we had at this camp a couple dozen of uh, developmentally disabled adults and several dozen uh, campers, elementary school, grades one through six. This storm came, we got a phone call to get to the safe room. That was a room below the lodge, and all the campers and staff had to be there. It was prepared for any and all type of emergencies. We all got there except for one counselor who happened to be working with a couple of his campers preparing for the worship service that night. They ran with the rest of the campers, with the two campers ran with the rest of the campers to the safe room. The counselor needed a shower. Other counselors told me he definitely needed the shower. He was working in the scene. Um, so we were there and we were amazed at the way the developmentally disabled adults cooperated interacted, played games, all the young elementary campers and these adults got along together. It was amazing how they interacted, looking out for each other. And we had other counselors that periodically would sneak out of the room and check the border of the woods looking for this other counselor. It was quite a while, well into the storm, that he showed up on the edge of the woods, looking up at the hill. A couple counselors ran down to help him up into the room. One stayed back at the doorway to open up the door for the three of them. They were looking out, taking care of each other. We were all amazed. This counselor shared his story. In a while, we got a phone call saying the storm had passed. It was safe to come out of the room. We did that. We also got a call from the maintenance man who wanted to take a tour of the campgrounds and see what kind of damage had been done. This counselor offered to go with him. He was able to point out damage done to buildings, the debris in the trees that had blocked paths and trails, and the maintenance man totally thanked him and us. There was hope that we could safely have a camp the next week without this counselor going with the maintenance man. The maintenance man let us know that he never would have seen all the damage done to the campgrounds or to the, the buildings. And we learned from this young man that granted the paths were blocked, damage was done to buildings, he couldn't get to the safe room but different campsites had these block buildings. He was able to huddle in a back room of one of these block buildings and stay safe. Um, and the, dam the maintenance man was able to get a crew of people to repair the buildings, clean the paths and trailways so that we could safe safely have a campgrounds for the next week. And what I learned from this was Wherever humans are involved, there is hope. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, for sharing that. Very true. And so this morning, let's continue by singing our opening hymn, Come, O Long Expected Jesus, everyone rise that are able, and it's page 122 in your hymnals.
grant us your liberty. Israel, strength and consolation, hope to all the earth impart. Dear desire of every nation, enter every longing heart. Born of people to deliver, born a child to come to reign, born to rule on earth forever, come be known to us again. By our own eternal spirit, come to claim on us your throne. By our self-sufficient merit, let us share your cross and crown. And please join me in our call to worship. We come to prepare the way. The way for Christ. The hope of Christ, the peace of Christ, to enter our world, to enter our hearts. We try, cry together in the wilderness. The kingdom of heaven has come near. We come to be part of the light. The light that shines in the darkness. Let us pray. To you, O Lord, we lift up our heads hearts and hands in prayer. We put our trust in you, believing that your word is true. We lift up to you our longing for hope in a despairing world. We lift up to you our need for hope in a time of deep hopelessness in our world. We lift up to you our deep desire for hope in a bleak and sometimes depressing world. We pro you promise hope in the coming of your son, and he was hope for the world. You promised hope in the, to the early church, and that hope was not denied. You promised hope to us, and we pray for your continued faithfulness. Lord, we pray for strength when our faith falters. We pray for you to pour out your love so it fills our lives and splashes over on everyone around us. Fill us with confidence in your presence in our lives. Fill us with your joy and peace. Keep our minds focused on you and our hearts filled with you and our, your outstretching arms for others. Amen. Join me with me in our confession of sins. Forgive us, O oh God. Cleanse our hearts and minds of all that prevents us from loving you and loving our neighbors. Our lives be marked by faith, act of love as we watch and wait for your breaking into our world once more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul prayed that the Lord may make our love overflow for each other and for everyone so that the Lord may strengthen our hearts in holiness so that we may, we may be blameless before God. The good news, therefore, is this. In and through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And so at this time, if you want to share the peace with each other, that would be nice.
Round them back up. <laughs> <It's a rodeo. laughs> yeah, herding <laughs> cats, isn't it? <laughs> So our scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, from uh, the prophet Jeremiah, which many times is known as the weeping prophet because he saw so many things to, to cry about. And yet Jeremiah, to me, is a prophet of hope. And that's what we're going to see today because Jeremiah definitely hoped in the Lord. And he definitely hoped in better times coming. And so that's what is so encouraging about this reading this morning from the prophet Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, it is a desolate waste without people or animals. Yet the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited neither by people nor animals, there will be heard once again the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of God, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good, his love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before, says the Lord. This is what the Almighty Lord says, in this place, desolate and without people or animals, in all its towns, there will again be pastures for shepherds to rest their flocks. In the towns in the hill country of the western foot, foothills and of the Negev, in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem, and in the towns of Judah, flocks will again pass under the hand of the one who counts them, says the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. And this is the promise. In those days and at that time, I will bring a righteous branch to sprout from David's line. And he will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteous Savior. For this is what the Lord says. David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel, nor will the Levitical priest ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. This is our scripture this morning. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Steve. It was very fun to start off our service this morning, wasn't it, with the lighting of our Advent candles, hope, love, joy, and peace. And it's wonderful to see, I hope you can see pretty good, that first light there, that first candle that is there, reminding us of the light always being there in us in Jesus Christ. And, of course, Emmanuel, God is with us. These are, of course, some of the words that uh, are associated with our scripture passage this morning. And here we are again. Another Advent season is upon us, and we are again anticipating the birth of Christ, the Messiah, or as stated in Isaiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Those words by themselves, they inspire hope, don't they? What also gives us hope is light, right? 
I don't know what time the sun has been going down around here lately, but up in Lansing, it's right about 4.30, and it seems to be creeping back. 4.15 the other day is how I counted. And, you know, I, with that in mind, I wistfully longed for the days of summer when the sun didn't go down until 10 o'clock. You remember those days? It was just a few couple of months ago. I know in other parts of the world it gets much darker quicker than Michigan. I think of Finland, I think of the folks that live on the polar ice caps where the sun really goes down early. And then of course, let's not forget what's coming up on December 1st. You know what's going on that day? Anybody? The winter solstice, right? The winter solstice, the day in which we will experience the shortest amount of light that day and the longest night because of Earth's poles reaching its maximum tilt away from the sun. So we have darkness with the light, and darkness was certainly before the people who lived in the kingdom of Judah. If you remember the kingdom of Judah in the southern region of what we call Israel today, there was a lot of darkness that Jeremiah talked about today. Darkness not born from the sun not being around or the winter solstice, but more darkness that was brought on from conquest. That is the conquest of the Judean people. That's the backdrop. That's the context of our scripture passage this morning. It's a somber, very bleak backdrop at that. The prophet Isaiah is speaking to people who have darkness in their daily living, in their souls regardless of whether or not the sun is coming through their home. This is where we find the people of Judea at their darkest moments in history. God is using Jeremiah this morning to speak to the people of Judea who are in exile. They're not in Judea, they're in exile. You see, the people for many years, if you remember, in Judea and elsewhere in Israel were living with idolatry, worshiping pagan gods, not following God's covenant. You remember that covenant? I will be your God, worship me and follow my commands. That was basically thrown out the window by the people of Judea and most in Israel. And so scripture maintains that God, as a result of that, withdrew God's divine protection of the people that opened the door for a conquest. The conquest I'm talking about that led to the people of Judea being exiled was to Babylon. The invasion of the Babylonian army set off that exile. If you remember your history, the Babylonian Empire is what we would now be in present day Iran and Iraq. The Babylonians, if you remember too, first conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Shortly thereafter, the Babylonian Empire went and conquered Judah and the southern kingdom. Jerusalem, for all practical purpose, because of that conquest, was laid wasted. The temple was destroyed. Many, many problems were there. People faced shortages of food and water. Disease and sickness abounded. As I said, the temple was destroyed. Basically, for all intents and purposes, the Babylonians sacked the temple, the holy shrine, the center of religion in the world. Judas King and many of the society's elites of Judea were carried away in exile into the Babylonian Empire. So this was a time of death and destruction and exile for the people living in the kingdom of Judah. And it's in that backdrop that Jeremiah, likely in prison for upsetting the king of Babylon, Babylon pens a letter to the people of Judah who are languishing in exile, in hopelessness, in despair. You know, I think it's safe to say that there is plenty of hopelessness and despair found in our world today. We have our share of it, don't we? We have political polarization. We are a divided country and a world. We have many people that are lonely, poor, and oppressed. Many among us, as we know from our food pantry, don't have enough food to eat, despite working two or three jobs. On the creation front, 
We have whole species of plants and animals becoming extinct. We can no longer find them. We have gun violence and mass shootings in America. As of October, at least 35,275 people have died from gun violence in America. That's an average of almost 118 deaths per day. Of those who died, 1,500 approximately were teens and 246 were children. We have wars raging across the world. Tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers and citizens have been killed or wounding, defending their country from Russia's invasion of their country. Tens of thousands of Russian soldiers, of course, have died, not to mention innocent Ukrainian citizens. Mass graves of Ukrainian citizens have been found in Ukraine. And of course, we are still looking at what's happening in Israel, where civilians have been killed and many kidnapped at the hands of Hamas and that group's attack on the country. Thousands of Palestinians and Israels have died because of the resulting war that followed in the Gaza Strip near Israel. Then, of course, there is the ripple effect that I think you've been reading and seeing on the news about in this country, right? Anti-Semitism is on the rise in this country, as well as Islamophobia. Recently, three Palestinian college students were shot while on a walk in Vermont. And in New York, serious threats have been made on social media against Jewish students at Cornell University that has resulted in many of those Jewish students fearing for their safety in America, in America of all places. And of course, we have the destruction in our creation. Call it climate change, call it extreme weather. We have tremendous twists and turns of our weather, don't we? On a scary scale, we have ice caps that are melting. Many of us living today have never seen this. Very bleak indeed. And then of course, on this personal side, we face another Advent season, right? and deal with these days of not only little sun, but we also, what are we doing now? Taking stock of the people who are not going to be with us this Advent season or haven't been for many years. We mourn the loss of our loved ones and we especially feel the tinge of them again not being us around the Christmas tree. With all that in mind, it seems that we can sometimes be in our own exile, can't we, with all of that? and the challenges that make it seem as though darkness is always around us. At least, we will never be forcibly deported to another country like the people in the kingdom of Judah. What God gives through Jeremiah this morning, though, to the people of Judah and all of Israel and us are words of encouragement, words of hope, hope embodied, symbolized, in the lighting of our Advent candle, our Advent candle of hope. Jeremiah promises there will be health and healing and a new day coming for the people in exile. Jerusalem will be rebuilt, as Steve said. People, livestock, will all come back and return to the kingdom of Judah. Judah will be saved, and the people will live in safety once again. God tells the people through Jeremiah, as God does for us, let's not forget that, that our creator will also be with us in our desolate times. That is the promise of God that Jeremiah made to the Judeans and that God and that promise makes to us today. Interesting times we live in for sure. There is hope. There is hope for the future. That Jeremiah gives us today through the words given to him by God. If you remember in verse 15, recall these words. In those days and that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And verse 16, in those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety, and this is the name by which it will be called the Lord is our righteousness. It may be hard to see it this morning, given the lighting here, but right beside me here, hold this up for you. This is a seedling. 
This is a pine seedling. No, the, I wish that this was the stump of Jesse, but this is a seedling. This seedling came to me from Marquette. You see, a few months back, I was up there attending to some uh, loose ends regarding my mother's death, and I went to an area in Marquette adjoining to what was once next to the backyard of my childhood home. I dug up this seedling because the area where I plucked it from is soon going to be disturbed. You see, a massive hospital, Marquette General, is being destroyed next to that property. It is being leveled, and the ground is being leveled. It's a bleak landscape for me. Reminds me that my childhood is being destroyed, if you will. So by digging up this seedling, I saved it from a bleak future. I saved it from certain destruction and possibly being plowed into the ground or run over by the treads of a bulldozer. This seedling, my friends, is a reminder of what once was, but also could be in the future. The seedling for me is a symbol of hope, a symbol of a new world ahead. So when I look at this seedling, I think of the words, again, from verse 15. I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David. With those words, with those words this morning that Jeremiah gives us, the righteous branch, who is the whole reason for Christmas, is coming. Our reason for hope in the present darkness, of course, it's well-founded. But this branch, this branch that will come, Christ is from a royal lineage of King David. Christ is the shoot, if you remember from Isaiah 11, 1. Christ is the shoot that shall come up from the stump of Jesse, the father of King David. God this morning in our scripture, my friends, was not sending another prophet to rebuild Israel and make right all the wrongs that the people had committed. That had happened, of course. But instead, God this morning is going to send none other, as our scripture hints about, none other than God. God incarnate in Jesus Christ to bring hope, hope for the world. Back to verse 15, which is so crucial to our scripture passage this morning. Again, I remind you of the words, he shall execute righteousness in the land. These words that Jeremiah penned for the people of Judah and us were essentially said by another prophet, Isaiah, who predicted that God would one day send one who will uphold justice and righteousness from this time onward, Isaiah 9. Did you note that righteousness and righteous show up together in verse 15? Today, those words in our divided country and across the globe most likely means different things to different people in our polarized environment. That's just the way it is. Many of our public officials are very skilled at dividing us with these words. So-and-so is righteous. We need to have righteousness in our policy. We need to have righteousness in this and that. We get different definitions, don't we, of righteous and righteousness. What we need to do this morning, and Jeremiah reminds us of this, is remember how those words are defined by God defined by Jesus Christ and adopt those definitions of righteous and righteousness given to us by God and Jesus. If you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, righteousness, interestingly enough, righteousness is the very first word spoken to John the Baptist by Jesus Christ. Yeah, righteousness. Jesus said, let it be so, now, in this way, to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness is this. It's not an attitude. It's not a rigid standard, but rather it's a code of conduct that God expects all of us to follow and that syncs up with God's wishes. Righteousness is this, too. It's doing the right thing, isn't it? All the time. 
without question, and even when it is inconvenient or could cause us problems. That's part of the definition of righteous and righteousness from God and Jesus Christ. Righteousness and righteous are the opposite of self-righteousness, which is about ego and seeing self-approval. Righteousness is a humble ethic of being a Christian, isn't it, that involves helping and loving others and being in loving relationships, and more importantly, living in a right relationship with God. Jeremiah, I think, also had in mind that God will provide leadership in the future that would reestablish systems that promote righteousness, systems of justice that were dismantled or minimized by past kings of Israel and the religious officials. Jeremiah had in mind that there would be a renaissance. Kings would now go forward with the help of the people to ensure people, all people, especially the poor, the marginalized, and the downtrodden, are treated just as well as the wealthy and the well-off. Righteousness. Righteousness. Jeremiah also does this for us this morning in his words. He points to an obligation that the Judeans and also us and the church always need to be under. And that obligation is one of commitment. That is, we as individuals and the church must ensure that our leaders in the church and outside the leaders of government practice righteousness and have it manifested and reflected in all areas of society to benefit all. Let's go back to scripture again, verse 16. We find in that verse the word saved. Saved. Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. I couldn't help but take note with that in mind, these words from biblical scholar Rachel Wren. She noted that the Hebrew word for saved is yasha. Yasha. 500 years after God brought the Judean people home from their Babylonian exile, a child would be born, and his parents would name him Yasha. Yasha, or Jesus, meaning God saves. God saves. Jesus saves. God came and dwelled among humanity and saved humanity in Jesus Christ. So with all of that in mind, let's remember that Christ is our light that overcomes the darkness of life. Christ is the one who came and gave us a new reality, a new way to live. Christ, the one who gave us important commands for living. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. All coming from Christ, the one who challenged the status quo, including our human-made systems of domination and power. I think it's also interesting to note this morning, my friends, that God and Jeremiah promised a new future for the Judeans and us that we should never forget. God forgave the Judeans for their sinful past, and God does the same with us and asks us to chart a new future just like the people of Judea. God saved the Judeans, and God saves us through Christ. That God, the God that saves us, is also the same God that blesses us as we go into the future. So again, in our longest days and our darkest nights, my friends, let us always remember that when things really seem troubling to us, there is always a light shining around us. There is always a hope around us. And that light and that hope, Jesus Christ. Speaking of light, if you remember in Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says the following. He says this about his teachings. Following his teachings is akin to us being like salt and light. As noted, uh, theologian Jim Wallace wrote, we should be like salt or a preserving, stabilizing force to preserve, protect, and deepen the values and behaviors that are needed by all humans. 
You remember Jesus said to his followers and to us, you, you are the salt of the earth. A call, my friends, to preserve the important things that protect and undergird human societies. Salt and light. Let's always remember to be Christ's light every day, shining in the darkness. Let us always remember that we are called to reveal what is wrong, what is untrue, what is a danger to all human life and reveal the things that need to be changed in our government and our other institutions made by humans. Remember, Jesus said to his disciples, and he says to us, you are the light of the world. Those words point to us that we should never, never let darkness cover up or paper over what is wrong in the world or accept what is wrong in the world. Yeah. We are always to be about exposing injustice and be forces that promote social, racial, and economic justice where and when it is most needed. These commitments, lest we forget, are integral to the gospel that Christ and God brings. A lot of people today have lost hope. So let us, through the power of Jesus, be their light, be their hope, be the hope that people need to see in the world. People who know nothing about our church or our faith so they can see Christ at work in us through the world and eventually, hopefully, be drawn to the light and the hope of Jesus Christ. Back to that salt and light stuff. The presence of salt and light all around us are all important elements for validating hope, especially on some days when it seems like the world is unraveling. And we've had a lot of those days, haven't we? Societies and movement, movements rather, need hope, the pr which is a primary contribution that undergirds our faith, isn't it? Hope is a decision. Think about that. It's a choice that we make because of this thing that we call faith and why we are here in these pews today. So, remember this. When we get overwhelmed by bad news, let us remember those who came before us, our parents, our children, our friends, our strangers, who all made sacrifices of their time, their talent, and even their lives so that we may have a better life. They gave us hope and encouragement, just like Christ. Hope. When I think of hope, I think of Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, and Gandhi, who all changed society. I think of the young pioneers of today, like Greta Thunberg from Sweden, who was calling attention to our planet's climate situation. I think of the Never Again movement started by students in the aftermath of the Parkland school shooting years ago that took the lives of 17 students. That movement never again has fanned out across America and over the years has advocated for common sense gun safety measures. That is hope. I think of Jimmy Carter. I think of the recent death of another wonderful example of hope in Rosalind Carter. I think of Israel's Menachem Begin and Egypt's Anwar Sadat who worked to bring peace in the Middle East years ago. When I think of hope, I think of the future farmers of Lapeer County and 4-H who are carrying on the traditions of farming in order to feed us. And when I think of hope, my friends, I think of all of you who are tireless in your actions and sacrifices, be them large or small, to help people around us. I thank you for that. Continue to do that where you are and what, whatever resources you have. So we are the hope, we are the light. We are, if you will, the small seedlings, the small needles on a larger tree, a tree of life in which the main root, the main branch, of course, is Jesus Christ, the righteous branch of Jesse. And because of Jesus being the righteous branch and God our creator, 
We're never alone in our darkest days. There's always light. There's always hope. There's always hope. Finally, I leave you with this. Hope is a two-way street. By that, I mean this. God provided hope to the Judeans and said their life would be better going forward. God provides us with that hope. But God required the Judeans to make a better world. We too are called to be the feet and the voice in the face of our creator God to spread God's kingdom and face the world and give hope to the world. But let's remember this. We are to be the hope that we wish for in the world. God requires it of us. Let us pray. God of the promised Messiah, as we wait for the fulfillment of your promise, we watch, we listen, and we open our hearts for your word. Show us signs of your presence, a light in the darkness, a voice in silence, and a stirring deep within us. Amen. Would you join me now as we sing our next hymn? Number 131, it came upon a midnight clear. Let us pray. God, this morning we rejoice in being here to worship you again for another Advent, this first Sunday in Advent. We are here with great gratitude for getting us here safely. Give us safe travels back, but know that our hearts are overwhelming with gratitude for all the good that you have provided and continue to provide us in our lives. Our friends, our family, where we work, where we live, 
we thank you for that. We thank you for all that we sometimes take for granted and never express thanks to you about. Lord, we ponder and we once again look forward to celebrating again the birth of your son, Jesus. Come long expected, Jesus. Continue, Lord, to embolden us and empower us to do your teachings in the world and to be a beacon of hope for other people so that by our working and our doing and our words, we may draw other people to the true light that you brought us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we're thankful for our men and women in the military, especially those serving in the Middle East during these challenging times that protect us and keep us from harm. We thank you for the people that put out the fires, keep our roads safe, keep us safe from crime, and who help us with our health. We thank you, Lord, for those, those unsung heroes. Lord, we pray for, as we do every Sunday, for peace. We pray for an end to the conflict in the Middle East. We pray for peace in Ukraine. We pray for peace anywhere where there is conflict. Lord, we note the people that we remember in our prayers from our Chimes newsletter. We pray for health and healing for John and Eric, Bernice, Geneva and Sharon, Kevin and Shelley, Lily, Trinity, Rita, Ivy and Claire, Dennis and Glenn, Chris and Noah, Elizabeth and Jacqueline, Sharon and Beth Ann, Vic and Joni, Reverend Rathman and Rex Ritchie. Lord, you are a God of hope. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And now we pause and say to you, silently or out loud, our own prayers and petitions to you. having heard our prayers and our petitions and been free to always be close by our side. Hear us now as we say the prayer that your son taught us. We say together out loud and together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise? Praise God from home. Please join me now in saying our offertory prayer. In this world, kingdom living. In our mouths, kingdom praises. In our hearts, kingdom goals. In our hands, kingdom gifts. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now, my friends, would you please be seated and to prepare for the Lord's Supper. Please sing with me two verses of Let Us Break Bread Together.
Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. Oh Lord, open mercy on me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall never hunger, and you who believe in me shall never thirst. So in the company that we are right now with God and Jesus Christ, all people who hunger for spiritual food, we come to the table this morning knowing this. The risen Christ is in our midst and with us in the sharing of this life-giving bread and the cup. Please pray. God, you are our creator. You're close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for always giving us your constant love. We thank you, God, for all that sustains life, and especially for the one who we await on December 25th, Jesus Christ, the one that you sent to be our Savior. Lord, we praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for calling forth us to be the church in the world, to be the church. Lord, bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine and bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table today so that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the risen Christ always in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Amen. My friends, on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus broke bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body. This is my body. It's been broken for you. Broken for you. Whenever you eat of this bread, think of me. Think of me. Next, Jesus took the cup, and after supper, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink from such a cup, think of me. Think of me. Through this broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. And through this cup of blessing, we participate in new life that Christ gives us. My friends, the table of the Lord is ready. And of course, as you know how we do the communion here, we ask that you refrain from eating your bread until all have received it, as well as the cup of wine. The table of the Lord is ready.
Would you please pray with me our post-communion prayer? Together we say, We thank you, most holy God, for refreshment at your table. Give us the grace to praise you with our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now, my friends, let us please stand. Let's sing our closing hymn for our worship service this morning, number 110, Now Bless the God of Israel. Now, my friends, before we close out our service this morning on this first Sunday of Advent, I think it's fitting that we leave with one final Advent reflection. It gets darker much earlier. I don't like this deep foreboding darkness, but I keep looking down, trying not to stumble and fall. I don't know what to expect. I have no time, no peace, no hope. I don't know what's ahead for me. The light is coming. Do not be afraid. Lord, where is the light? It is here on the path so that you won't stumble. It is here in my heart so that you will not be weary. It is here in my soul to give me hope. Lord, help me to see and feel the presence of your light. My friends, go from this place to be the hope that you wish to see in the world embodied in God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go, my friends, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.